everyone and welcome. I am Jakiva Phillips, the editor-in-chief of Word Lit Zine, which is a quarterly for Seattle's poets and writers. And this show you're about to see is Z-Sides. Now Z-Sides is a take on the term B-Sides, which refers to the lesser known tracks on a very popular album. Well, in this show, we're gonna bring Seattle's underground scene to your very home. We're gonna be talking to all of Washington State's poets, writers, storytellers, tastemakers, troublemakers, and so much more. Now what you're about to see is part of a three-part segment we are calling Poetry Tastemakers, where we have Washington State Poet Laureate Claudia Castro Luna. We also have Seattle civic poet Anastasia Renee, and last but not least, youth poet laureate Lillianne Baumgart. First, they're gonna be sharing their work with you, and then we're gonna have real talk with all things poetry. Are you ready? Up next is Washington State Poet Laureate Claudia Castro Luna. Maria Santos' sweetest apple. They say we live on either side of a border. I say that's fodder for a sexist imagination. Coyote's tooth does not alone bite, and falcon's feather takes not alone to the sky. Silo living is not for living things, like the braid on my abuela's back and beads on a rosary strand. Interlinked, we are rain, dust, stars. Tyranny of the Milky Way. The way clouds taste as they go from castles to rabbits above your head. You are 12, your skin damp from the humid tropical day, the grass under your arms and legs benign even if itchy. The way a million stars scatter at night and you in jersey gown and bare feet seek the same spot from earlier in the day to count far away incandescent rocks and tucked behind your ear your secret wish to spot a single UFO. The way a slice of tres leches cake on your 13th birthday surrenders in unison on your tongue its sweet milks. The way at 12 you tasted marvel and by 14 you tasted war. Claudia! Thank Hello. you so much for being a part of Z-Sides. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Well, I love what you're doing. So you're traveling from, he, you know, over here on the west side, you're traveling a lot to the east side. Um, what do you think that east, you know, eastern Washington voice is? What are some of the things that you're seeing that are popping up? Uh, it's, well, I just, basically I just took over my, the position as Poet Laureate, but I have had a chance to go travel east and so here's a thing that I, that I didn't know, because I have been east, of course, visiting as a, you know, on spring break, we'll go, you know, someplace with the kids, my mm -hmm. family. Um, but I'm traveling into communities of uh, writing communities, and poetry is alive and well in a lot of our eastern uh, cities in eastern Washington. Ellensburg has a really rich, uh, poetry community, Walla Walla has a, I mean, this, uh, this is way east, you yeah. know, uh, Pullman and certainly Spokane has sort of a renaissance of poetry happening. Really? Mm -hmm. And Yakima too. Um, and of course, all up and down in Puget Sound from Bellingham to Olympia, there's, you know, there's a lot of effervescence around poetry and poetry readings and open mics and teaching kids in schools. So, I think the common denominator for what I've discovered is poetry is alive and well. It, it, is, it, it is happening as much as it is happening here in Seattle, elsewhere. And you know, sometimes like I've come across people who've been curating poetry series for 25 years. You've in never little, heard of in, them. In little towns, yeah. you know? And I think that is where poetry lives. That's where the, where the light keeps, keeps lit, you know? And these people who come together month after month to hold an open mic, to just express themselves and share the love of words together. Um, I, think, I think this is why it just never goes away. It's been around for as long as we have been around as humans uh, because we have a, a need for it. And I mean, I have been astounded 
to see how many communities, rural communities, have um, you know poetry series that they curate and nurture. That is not to say that there's not work to be done, and and that mm -hmm. goes for Seattle as well. Yeah. I think that yes, we have a rich community of writers and. Um, Poet, poetry and creating poetic experiences, if you will, but there's more to be done. And the more, to me, always comes in terms of communities of color and in terms of immigrant communities, because when I think of silence voices, I always go to immigrant women who, whose uh, predominant preoccupation a lot of times is their children. So they are taking their kids to school. They are nurturers, right? Mm -hmm. And the last thing they take care of is themselves. Yep. And getting whatever it is that they're feeling across and having very little opportunities in languages that, in their home language, to, to do some work around that. Yeah. So I always think if, if I want to work with a, if I had the chance to work with a group of people, it would be with immigrant women not just Latina, not just Spanish-speaking women, but you know, across the board, our, our Eastern African population here in, in the Puget Sound is huge. Yeah. What are, where are they at the poetry readings? That's you know? very true. I've never seen uh, any yeah. of our s huge Somali population at poetry readings yeah. or even sharing. And I'm, I don't even know if there's events that are happening in yeah. those places where they are presenting their, you know, are they presenting their work? I have yeah. no idea. It's not advertised. Yeah. You know? And you know that they have poems. And you know that there's poems yeah. they love. Or at least if know? they don't have poems, they at least have something to say. Oh, Maybe absolutely. they just don't know that it yeah. can come out in poetry. Yeah. 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 No, it's a big loss. It's a big loss for us, I think, uh, as, a, as a whole, to not have those voices at the table. And, um, and that is true, you know, of rural communities in Washington State, where a lot of the immigrants are Latino immigrants who are doing um, a lot of the rural work harvesting, asparagus harvesting, apples harvesting, wheat. I mean, this giant harvest that happened, somebody's got to do it. Yeah. And, and those voices are nowhere to, they don't occupy a space, a cultural dimension. And the cultural dimension is our soul. You know, as, mm -hmm. uh, that's, where we, that's where our soul resides, right? This, the work that we do as artists is like you were saying earlier, that's uh, 15 years from now, maybe this transitional moment will be captured best in the work that artists were doing because we are garters of the, of, of the soul, not only of ourselves, of our own souls, but our communal expression. And so I think we're, we're missing out, you know? Yeah. So yes, there's poetry readings happening and series happening across the state, but there is, there's more to be done. And I'm hoping that as I move through my term that I can make connections with people um, and maybe begin to create spaces where those voices come in. I think that, I mean, it's right, I, I am 100% sure that there are avenues for you to do that. You know, there's, it's impossible to think that there aren't people who don't have something to say or don't have something to share. Yeah. And my new favorite thing is guardians of the soul. Can we get t-shirts <laughs> made of that? Like artist, guardians of the soul. Or let's, let's I'll just be, one. let's I'll just be one. poets, right? Poets, guardians of the soul. Yes, I'm with you, you on go. that one. There All right, go. I'll get some t-shirts made. We'll walk I'll around. I'll wear one. Yeah, we'll get, we'll I'll wear it in up. my ambassadorship, you know, with my ambassador hat. Do you have an ambassador no, hat? No, I don't. Oh, okay. But it'll be the t-shirt. Okay, yeah, that'll be the t-shirt. Because like, you know how the Pope has a miter? So I was like, yeah. does the Washington State Poet Laureate that have their own good. miter? Because that would be actually that would pretty be really, That would be really good. <laughs> yeah, especially for a short person like myself. When I walk into a room, it's like, you know, <laughs> oh, you're the poet. <laughs> Oh, I didn't see you. We'll just make it taller and brighter, and then nobody can yeah. like help but not look yeah. at you. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so, all right, so we've been talking about some of the things you're doing. What are some of the things that you see uh, in the future of your job, not just as Washington State Poet Laureate, but for you, Claudia Castro Luna, adjunct faculty at Seattle U, which, by the way, do you teach poetry at Seattle U? Yes, I mean, I, so I taught a course that was a language course um, and the interpretation of it was very wide, and I chose to teach it through poetry, and I'll be doing that again in the, in the um, winter of 2019 and in the spring of 2019. Okay. So more like a multidisciplinary courses that I choose to teach through poetry. 
That's actually super awesome. And I remember when we were talking um, uh, during our Word Lit Zine interview, uh, you were talking about how when you were doing urban planning growing up and or in school, yeah. and just the whole idea of how you know the papers that you were write were always sort of through that lens of a poetry or sort of poetic license. Mm -hmm. So I love that you're still teaching that in a certain sense, yes. right? The yes. same thing that was like pecking at you and your yes. career, you're just yes. gonna try and get a, you know, get it into other people's ideas. That is ideas. correct, yeah, yeah. Wearing, wearing the social historian or social, or the urbanist really, the urbanist hat and, and the poet hat and mixing them together and, and, and it's inviting the, the students to, to come along with me in these journeys of, of mm -hmm. discovery, you know? Yeah. We're gonna have to get you two hats now. We'll get you two hats. <laughs> Let's see if we can get three and then we'll make it a hat trick. Hey! I love hats. <laughs> Sorry, that was a corny <laughs> joke, but I, I had to say it. Hey, I love hats, <laughs> actually. Really? Okay, I could definitely see you wearing like a nice beret, like tilted towards the side, yeah. and like a red one, so maybe I'm just feeling that because I'm feeling your outfit right now, mm -hmm. but I think you would rock that so yeah. well. Yeah, oh yeah. I have been known to wear many hats yeah. in my life. Both literal and figurative. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Right. No, so, true, uh, true, true. so what's next for your writing? What things oh. do you have in the works? Well, I have been writing on a memoir for a long time. I've been working on this book for a long time, and hopefully, I will be uh, finishing it up. And then, you know, by the end of the year, it would be a wonderful thing. Um, uh -huh. And it's a memoir about my experience leaving El Salvador. I was 14 when I left, and my family was fleeing the Civil War. And in the 37 years that I've lived here in the U.S., um, and as the population of Salvadorans has increased overall in the U.S. to the tune of um, the fact that we are now the fourth largest Latino group in the U.S., that is hugely yeah. significant. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and yet our experience of what, what created our exodus isn't really well known. And when it is explained, it's always sort of academics do it, so this becomes kind of an academic um, endeavor for people who are historians or political scientists or something like this. Journalists have also you know, worked on telling the Salvadoran experience, but very, very few Salvadorans talking about our own, uh, our, in our own voices what brought us here. I mean, the exception, for instance, Javier Zamora just came out with a book from Copper Canyon that is really well received, undocumented is the, is the name of, the, of his poetry oh, book. I've heard of that, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And he is like one of a few Salvadoran poets um, with books out there sharing this experience of a very specific experience of war and immigration and what, what does that mean, you know, for us and for us as the U.S. to have this, you know, Salvadoran stamp on the, on the annals of our, of our history, right? Uh, very few, though, told in the point of, from the point of view of kids or women, again, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so this effort is to, to to share my experience as a kid, a first person uh, narrative of what it was like to live through the Salvadoran War and leave, and actually leave mm -hmm. and survive. Um, so I have that in the works. I also have a couple of books, one that I want to edit that is a collection of poems that I've got people from all over the country. This is again um, talking about the Salvadoran experience, that it would be something that I would edit. and then a couple of books of poems that are rattling in my head and I write now and then, but, um, so yeah, it would be great. I'm taking some time off in the summer to maybe start working on those poems. You know how it is. Yeah. You write something and you have it halfway finished and you're like, I'm gonna come back, I'm gonna come yeah, back. Yeah, right, you sit down, you're yeah. like, you know, I'm just gonna let the art, you know, the art vibe come to me and then sometimes it comes like that, other times it comes four month yeah. stints. Yeah, <laughs> so I have a whole bunch of poems, half started poems that would be great to, to sit down and, and work on them. So personally, I have lots of writing. I have lots of All writing. Right. You're gonna give Anastasia Renee a run for her money, because she has, <laughs> I mean, she put out three books this year. Oh, I know, that's, I mean, that's you're gonna, insane. Well, I don't know, you're coming up on her between all those projects you just rattled off. Well. So, who knows what's yeah. gonna happen there. Well, but it, it is that, it's like a burning, you know? I wrote an article for Crosscut when our president made, made a comment about particular countries that were, um, it, it was a really crude comment. Mm -hmm. uh, 
that he made about some African countries and Central American countries and countries in the Caribbean. Yeah. And I remember waking up and I took it so hard. I took it so hard and I thought to myself, why am I reacting this way when I should know better? I have, you know, I should mm. know better. I am not, I'm not a young person, but it was just so hard. And so I, I ended up writing this article um, that was published in Crestcut. And part of what I said was, as, as the morning wore on, and I worked through uh, this um, storm of feelings inside myself, feeling indignant and feeling just saddened, deeply saddened, and feeling angry, really angry. So much anger after, yeah, after so, that. Yeah, so, so this turmoil. Of I, as, as the day wore on, kind of this, this sentiment came in that was more a burning to make art. And I thought, this is, this is what I'm going to, this is what I'm going to do, this is what I need to do, and it is to write to write myself until I can't not more, you know, just to mm -hmm. facilitate writing in others, to edit projects, to create spaces of art making, and to write myself. This is how I need to respond. This is the only avenue I have, and the only way in which I will not sacrifice my integrity by getting angry in the same fashion yeah. in which that comment was made, you yeah. know, with such ignorance and, and just such spite of humanity, you yeah. know? I think as artists, uh, especially as artists of color, like I feel like any time like somebody says, you know, something like that, it's like our response is to make more art, to yeah. just like prove them wrong. It's yes. like, you think we come from this kind of a country? Let me show you what yeah. my country is. Yeah. And then you can tell me you know, that where I come from is not a good place. That yes. It's like a crap hole of a country. Yes, you know? yes. Yeah. And I mean, part of my, in that article, part of me wrote that the pain that I felt was that I had, I haven't been to El Salvador a lot in the 37 years that I left because I have so much trauma around the war. But the last time I was there, I've been there three times, and the last time I just was in awe at how beautiful it is. Mm -hmm. It is beautiful. You know, it's this tropical place with exuberant vegetation everywhere you go and these flowers that are just like yourself, you know, bright and beautiful <laughs> and blooming and gorgeous. You know, you're like walking around in this incredible landscape of bird sound and color. And so the last thing I would think of is to think of this place that I know as a, as a you know, a, an insipid gray, you know, no good place. Yeah. You know? So I think that was what the hurt came through that first and then it sort of cascaded into other feelings. But, but the end of that was this conviction to myself that it is, it, that the answer resides in art making, like you said. Yes through our art, we will prove all the haters wrong. I totally agree with that. Anybody who has something different to say about where you come from, where I come from, where other people come from, they're gonna be sorely mistaken when they finally see the art that is produced from those people. Mm -hmm. Claudia, thank you so much for being a part thank of you. Z Sides thank and for this so interview. Yeah. You are so wonderful. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Claudia Castro, Luna, uh, I know that you're at home probably watching this on your TV, but you should clap for her anyway, just like this. Ah. She is kind of my guru church person, so welcome to church. There you go. All right, so. <laughs> All right, so tune in for another installment. We, if you have not seen, uh, if you have not seen our other two amazing poetry tastemakers in this segment, Lillianne Baumgart, our youth poet laureate, or Anastasia Renee, our Seattle civic poet, I highly recommend you check those out. <laughs> Jakeva Phillips here, your host for Z Sides. Today is Pearls of Wisdom Day. So I'm here with three amazing poets that are gonna help dole out some friendly advice from getting your manuscript to some serious bookshelf eye candy. So please welcome Anastasia Renee, Seattle civic poet, Claudia Castro Luna, the Washington State Poet Laureate, and last but certainly not least, the Youth Poet Laureate, Lily Ann Baumgart. All right, so first question, I'm going to pose to you, Anastasia. You put out three books in one year. So how do you even begin to make that happen? I have to be honest, it's not like I wrote all the books in one year. Um, I don't know anyone who can write books, three books in one year and publish them. Not without like COVID. Not without, yeah, some, <laughs> yeah some serious stuff or something. Um, so for me, one of, one of my, secrets or one of the reasons why I think that I had enough material for, 
for three books is that I, I have been writing every day since August 2010. I don't necessarily think this is something everyone should do, um, but for me it is one of the reasons why I had so much work and it just sort of happened that way. I um, presented my work at an AWP in 2015 to a publisher. I was really brave. I was just like, hey, I think you should publish my work. And she was just like, really? And I was like, yeah, really. <laughs> um, and I came with the manuscript and she was just like, no, we don't take manuscripts on the spot, but send it to me. So that was one thing that happened to work out. The other one, the other publisher, um, these people had seen me read a lot um, in the city. You never know when you're reading at an event what who is in the audience, and that's how that came about. And the other one was because I, I saw a couple of people that I really liked their work on this certain press, and even though they said they were not taking submissions, again, I sort of emailed someone and I said, well, I know you're not taking submissions, but I'd love it if you have a look at my manuscripts just for whenever you are. And that happened between 2015 and 16, and it just so happened that all of the far out publishing date ended up being, dates ended up being 2017. But it wasn't, I didn't just wake up and write three books and then there they were. <laughs> I mean, I wish, maybe for 2019. Right, that's the goal for 2019. <laughs> that's the goal, yeah, but that's how those came to be. Right. Still, I had to write over time. They didn't just formulate. Yeah. So there is no like easy way of like, boom, I just want books. You actually have to put in the work, is yes, what you're saying. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. I keep telling the youth, no, I didn't wake up January 1st and wrote three books, and then there they were in July. That's not what happened. <laughs> yes. I love your boldness, though. People are like, <laughs> yeah. we don't take this, and you're like, mm, yeah. but you, you do, should, right? Yeah. You should. <laughs> I, I did that. Yeah. <laughs> so you definitely say assertiveness is a huge part of yes. getting your work out there. Assertiveness and doing the work. You can't just talk about that you're a writer. You can't mm -hmm. talk about what you're writing. You actually have to be writing so that when an opportunity presents itself, you have the work. Stay ready. You have to stay ready, but you can only stay ready if you have the work. Mm -hmm. Is what if I what if I got an opportunity and they were like, yeah, what do you have? And I'm like, oh, I have to go write it. I mean, <laughs> so I think it's a both and. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So uh, Claudia, as an adjunct faculty member at Seattle U, I mean, you work with you know the young kids, the up and coming poets. What kind of advice would you have for them? Mm, I would say, write, write, write. Um, I think that. A lot of times we are very concerned, we're, we're our own worst critics and we criticize our own work constantly and uh, imagine what others may think of it or how it's going to be um, received and I think that is really detrimental to, to, our, to our writing process because writing and critiquing are two very different things. I mean it takes bravery to, to write, you know, it takes it takes just losing yourself in what you're writing and just going for it um, rather than um, a mental space, which is the space of critiquing. I mean, writing is heart, you know, critiquing is mind. And you can't, it took me a long time to understand that, that writing, you just, I just have to let walk into that, walk down that road. I don't know where it's gonna go. I don't know what turns it's gonna take. I just have to trust it that it will be okay and that, I, that I'll be fine walking down this path and not constantly looking back over my shoulder thinking, but what if this or what if that person doesn't like it or how this will be, forget about it. Do write. And then once you've written up, like uh, Anastasia said, you know, you could take, you could then, if you have a trusted person, you could show the work to a trusted person. I mean, when I was writing early on, as a college student, I made the mistake of showing my writing, my poems, which I kept so close to my heart because I didn't dare share them. Um, and when I did, they were not, it wasn't a, a, an effort that was encouraged. And so it, was, it took me back, way back. I mean, I lost ground in that, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I would say, write, write, write. And when you feel like you wanna share with somebody, select someone whom you trust, who will, who will build you rather than critique you because, um, you know, it's, it's work. Like Anastasia said, it just it doesn't happen overnight. 
Yeah. Did you also, because Anastasia said she wrote every day since August of 2010, do you also just like write every single day? Do you have your own personal uh, regimen or schedule? No, I mean, I wish I could say yes. I mean, in the best of times, like this morning, I, had, I took my son to um, his ferry. He goes to school on one of the islands, on Vashon Island. He's on a really early ferry, and I came home at 7 a.m. back from the ferry, mm -hmm. and I was able to sit down and do and write, which was wonderful. Mm -hmm. So on a perfect day, that's what I do. Um, but sometimes I have so much going on that I can't say that I, that I do, and I no longer wait for that morning time. I mean, mm -hmm. if I have something that comes that I need to write it, I'll stop the car, I'll talking to my phone, <laughs> you know, I'll be walking and I'll be putting it in a note on my phone, yeah. you know, I'll do whatever to capture what it, that moment or what that thought. Yeah. When you said stop the car, I just pictured you on the freeway and you're like, stop! <laughs> <laughs> Haiku! I, I do pull over. <laughs> I bet I've been known to pull over. I, mean, I, pull I over. love that though. Yep. I love that. I think for, I, I had a similar thing, you know, I, I would be like, I'm going to wait to have the proper time to write. And yeah. it's like, I hardly ever came around. And so actually just forcing yourself, I feel something now, I'm going to actually sit down and write it. Yeah. That's, that's great advice. Um, so Lily, you actually just recently put out your book submitted to the personal ads this month mm -hmm. of May so of 2018 yes the 25th of May I'm rambling now I'm sorry uh, <laughs> oh, I'm just God. super excited for your book Thank uh, you. what was that process like from start to finish it was really exhausting um, it's part of the position as youth poet laureate is at the end you will get your book published as we hand over the position my book is released, um, which is very exciting, but a year is a really short time mm -hmm. to put out a book. Yeah. Um, Especially because did you have everything in, during, before that year or were you kind of spending a portion of that year writing and then publishing? Like did, how much of the work did you have before you really had to barrel down with this publishing duty? I had um, started a manuscript before I was mm -hmm. awarded the position. Mm -hmm. um, through encouragement of Matt Gano and Aaron Counts, who are the mentors for each Youth Poet Laureate, but also the finalist cohort as a whole. And they were like, everyone should get start putting manuscripts together. And I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then they were like, you want, like, you're, it's you, you're gonna put out a book. And I was like, oh, thank God you told me to do that because mm -hmm. <laughs> this would have been a lot harder. Mm -hmm. Did um, they uh, work with you with, um, you know, the cover art and stuff like that? Because that's also another thing with like publishing your book. It's not mm -hmm. just once you have the manuscript, it's not just writing every day. It's the whole process mm -hmm. of, you know, your cover art, you know, what kind of typeset, what kind of yeah. size of the book. Um, did you have any, you know, creative control in that respect? Yeah, it was a bit um, restricted through Penmanship Books is the publisher that I have, and mm -hmm. they typically do photographs of the author on the front of the book. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is so quick. I don't have the time to be like, hey, I wanted to have a friend draw X, Y, and Z or whatever. You know, I was mm -hmm. just like, you know what? I'm going to focus on my writing. And so the cover, honestly, was not entirely like an afterthought, but I'm very, very lucky to have um, Aisha Alamine, who is my photographer, who is incredibly creative and was like, oh, we should do this and that, and you should be wearing this, and go stand by that pretty like tree with those flowers on it. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. thank you, because I would have no idea what to do. <laughs> um, so as a whole, like putting it all together was a very collaborative effort. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I love that. Like, you know, it takes a village to it make does. a book. I it love really that. Does. It does. <laughs> It really does. All right, so that has been our segment on Pearls of Wisdom for getting your book published. If you want to know more, you can find any one of these lovely people on the interwebs. Go buy their book, go see them at a reading, and then you can buy them a cup of coffee and talk shop. Uh, but either way, keep on writing, and we will see you on the next Z-Sides.